Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our second half of Hunter's Gathering. I am your producer and host, Markia McCarty, and this is a chill behind the scenes look at game design, art design, music design, just everything that goes behind those tabletop RPG games that we both hold so dear to our hearts, and specifically the ones at Hunter's Entertainment but also less specifically the ones in general in the field. So what will be have what will be happening for this part of the program is that we will be talking about the future of the Outbreak Strain series. So this would be a sneak peek, a very nice conversation during this spooky season to talk all things Outbreak Undead, Zombie, Revenant and more. Oh my. So, but before we get started, I just want to go ahead and announce the winner of the uh, Hunters Presents giveaway that happened on this past Tuesday. So I want to say uh, congratulations to Josh from Wolverhampton, England. Uh, they have won an Outbreak Undead Survivor's Guide, Game Master's Guide, and Strain Series Zombie, uh, zombie <laughs> PDF Bundle. So the way that you can enter into that giveaway and then also for uh, gatherings giveaways, we are starting a giveaway starting tonight and we will announce our winner uh, next week, Friday at 6 p.m. PT. And we will be giving away an Alice is Missing Roll20 Code Plus PDF. Uh, so isn't that just perfect for us also being part of Roll20 Con right now? So to be able to have more information and to go ahead and enter into our giveaway, go to huntersentertainment.com slash giveaway. So as for everyone who is joining us for Roll20 Con in general, uh, we have our conversation tonight that we are about to have. Um, also tomorrow, we have Outbreak Undead The Fog. That will, that's a live play that will be happening at 6 p.m. PT for Roll20 Con. You will go to the same channel, Hunters Entertainment, to be able to view it. Our GM for that will be a co founder of Hunters Entertainment, Ivan Van Norman. So, yes, he will be killing a lot of your people that you enjoy from the internet. Uh, so, that's, that's something that's going to happen. And then also on Sunday, we'll have uh, Alice is Missing live play that'll be facilitated by creator of Alice is Missing, Spencer Stark. That will also be 6 p.m. PT on Sunday. So that is uh, October 24th and October 25th. So you have that to look forward to along with this conversation that we are about to have right now. So um, the people that are joining me uh, in this conversation, we have uh, Alex, our community guy, uh, Alex Hillman, uh, project manager. Thanks so much for joining us for this conversation about the future of the Outbreak Strain series. Oh, for sure. I'm looking forward to it. This is a very fun project and one that's very near and dear to me, so... Uh, and we also have uh, the creator of Dance Macabre. Uh, you know them from many other places in the internet as well, um, Alquin Gersh. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here and talk about this stuff. Heck yes, we're going to get spooky with it. Uh, and then, of course, last but not least, uh, co-founder of Hunters Entertainment and also creator of Chimera that we'll be talking about tonight, uh, Christopher J. De La Rosa. Thanks so much for joining us. Good to be here. How are you doing? Excellent. So yeah, um, Alex, actually, can you get the ball rolling for us a little bit with uh, these properties and where they fit with uh, Hunter's Entertainment uh, in general? Yeah, absolutely. So the Strain series, we've uh, already technically officially kicked it off. So uh, as you kind of mentioned with the, the giveaway there, we have Strain Series Zom V, uh, which is already available. And what the Strain series are going to do is since Outbreak is a very sandbox style uh, zombie game where you can really make whatever kind of zombie apocalypse you want and test your zombie survival plan against that, um, that takes a lot of world building on the GM's part to decide, you know, what kind of zombies do I want? How do I want to structure the world that I'm going to present to my players? So the Strain series is going to fill that gap for the GM. So that way, if you don't really want to take the time to really come up with all those details on your own, you can buy these prepackaged settings via the Strain series where they'll have a very specific type of undead or zombie or whatever term you want to throw at it. We're going to hear a few terms tonight. Um, 
And then you can kind of also have background information for what would be going on in the world that you as the GM can use to flavor your stories while still keeping your focus on the survivor group that you have as your players. Um, so you get those nice personal stories still, but you do have that extra background detail to kind of bleed into your world. So that's kind of the intent of the Strain series for second edition is to bring that campaign setting kind of feeling uh, to the game. Excellent. Uh, yeah, and if you really, really love the conversation that we're about to have, I heartily recommend for you to join us on Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. PT, where we are literally doing an ongoing um, Outbreak Undead uh, Zombie campaign right now. So if you're like, oh, I need more Strain series, you can get it on Tuesday, and then including uh, these properties when they come out. And um, also, if you want to go back over any of the conversations that we have, like you know, for Fridays for Hunters Gathering, you know, we've had a number of these really great deep dive conversations. Um, you, and let's say that you're not a subscriber just yet, we do post everything on YouTube. It is about a week after time, about a week and a day before. So it'll be like Thursday of next week, you'll be able to see this conversation on YouTube. So don't worry, we got you. We've all been there, but go ahead and give us a follow or join our community on Discord. Uh, so yeah, let's go ahead and jump into this conversation. Uh, so Chris, Chimera is going to be coming around the corner. Can you tell us some more about Chimera? Like, what is it? I mean, I, I, I know, I know, obviously. <laughs> so if you could just let all the rest of us know the in and outs of Chimera, what is it? And uh, what can people expect? Well, Chimera is basically the the body horror version of of the uh, of the undead or zombies we've seen in, in popular culture, um, or they don't even have to be zombies, just like creatures that are body horror. Um, the, the the most popular one that comes with most uh, in the touchstone is like the the thing. If you want to look at it that way, it's not the thing. It's not the same thing as the thing. But if you want to it's, it's like a picture in your mind's eyes of what kind of things you'd be facing, it's a lot like that sort of thing. Um, so it's the idea is that it's called the chimera virus because it basically can graft things onto itself just to kind of accumulate biomass and that's then that's how it operates but what the way um, we develop these strain series that you kind of develop the baseline of what the virus is capable of doing and then you kind of see how the world the world around it reacts to that okay all right so um can you give us a little bit of your background as a creator and then uh some inspiration from your background that you brought into chimera in general because it sounds very it's like cronenberg it, yeah. it, that's what i'm <laughs> that's why i'm hearing from it so yeah i mean there's a lot of good th horror movies that incorporate body horror in some form or another but cronenberg is obviously well known for that especially um like i'm, I'm a fan of the fly um so that's the kind of stuff I would reference. The thing is also another one that is a, point, a, is a, a, a touchstone. Um, as far as like ones that are a little bit more on the nose in regards to um, zombies or the undead or anything like that, um, Resident Evil uh, Revelation has mm -hmm. opponents that are very similar to the kind of look and feel of like really distorted uh, humanoid creatures that are like they've they look they've been like in the bottom of the ocean for a while they're just it's it's that's the kind of thing it's it's taking that the the, the fear of the infection feel the undead and then adding another element to it you know sometimes literally grafting animal heads on just it's it's very the art that's come out of it is very uh very unique and i will also say just not as more as more of a personal reference is uh the art of anthony jones is a big inspiration and thankfully he was available to do this for me but he's done tremendous work in this area and video games in general and, and movies and things like that and he was uh willing to play ball with us and actually loved the concept and so a lot of, and he's actually his artwork's actually in first ed quite a lot sorry in second ed quite a lot but we're expanding on it and using more of it for this and he does a lot of the mutant body horror stuff too and it's a lot of a lot of twisted limbs a lot of distorted features it's really uh unsettling stuff and i love it <laughs> so literally body horror <laughs> oh, yeah <laughs> exactly okay yeah so uh continuing with this like strain of thought with um what are what are some themes that um chimera explores uh, f as far as thematics go, it's kind of well, the the idea is that it's more psychological, uh, because some of the things that you're facing are 
not really physical threats to you because they're either so distorted or so like small or like the idea is that morale becomes a much bigger thing so mm-hmm. if you have <clears throat> if you lose morale your your character's basically out it's like all right done i'm kind of done with this i'm going to leave um and the entire and the impetus for that we actually came up because it's almost putting the cart before the horse a little bit because i did because everyone's teased like they want to do like a cruise ship scenario even back in first days like oh i want to do a cruise ship i want to do a cruise ship. I'm like that sounds like fun do it and they never did so i did it um and the 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 whole setting lent itself to a lot of um situations where things were hiding in the dark corridors and things had no power so it, it, the 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 setting d- demanded more than just like yeah zombies are in the, in the stairwell whatever it's like okay let's let's make it something really terrifying and that's where the watcher came out and the watcher is my personal favorite uh because basically what it does is it just obliterates morale when you're crazy because basically it's someone who is fully aware of their condition and their body has just become festooned with sense organs and so they see and hear everything and taste everything and I'm, and I'm going to break the illusion a little bit. That was actually an illusion to the tick. Um, because when Arthur became the tongue, he said, I can taste the floor. I can taste the floor. Oh, right. Oh, and oh, as a child, that messed with me pretty badly. He's like, what does the floor taste like? <laughs> Why would you want to taste it through your feet? How, that, how terrible that would be. And so, uh, and, and, I, and I hate the fact that that's actually the, 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 my frame of reference, but it's more, more than I care to admit. Um, and so the idea is that this thing is just bombarded with senses and then it, so it hides in the darkest, quietest place it can find. And so when the, when the, when the survivors come blundering in with their flashlights saying, Hey, what's around here? They basically start it, and then they basically run for it, run towards them screaming to be killed. Um, and so that is not a threat physically because they want to die, but, uh, that makes you want to leave wherever you are. Yeah. And so yeah. that's the kind of thing we're playing with and also um if something's left to its own devices if it's not if it's not being predated upon it's like also like uh, an evolution of it like it could be become because like, but what happens is when it gets to a certain point it starts to take like animal characteristic on, on as well and also fungal characteristic it basically it becomes just a thing that becomes <laughs> a thing um that becomes like it evolves to wherever it's it's it is so if it doesn't need to be hunting anymore it can just attract it just basically sends out pheromones that 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 basically addle the senses and people just kind of blunder into into like an acid pool or something like that oh, so there's no. a lot of yeah a lot of demented stuff but it basically and those and those are the spawn lords who basically spawn they're not infected creatures they are basically born of this virus and they're born of just the biomass and its genetics the, the genetic codes that it, it is basically assimilated into itself so it makes they can look like small dogs they could look like bats they could look at like anything just they've that they've managed to accumulate the the, uh, the DNA for, and so the whole and they could be combinations thereof. Um, so it's a lot of mixing and matching of things that are terrifying, and which is a puppy lot of fun bats. to play with. Did you just make me have to envision body horror puppy bats? How I dare did. you? <laughs> well, I'm not taking it back. <laughs> <laughs> the bats are for the baseball bats are made for a reason. There you go. Get them out of the sky before they get to you. No, I, I really enjoy this concept because um, I don't know if um, any of you have um, Game Cubes or if you grew up with Game Cubes or anything like that. This reminds me of the game Eternal Darkness, where it's like, yeah. yes, things could physically go after you, but sanity is precious. And that's what this sounds like for me. And it's like, I hate, okay, sorry, I keep on bringing up 2020, but I'm just going to do it. That's one, of, that's one of the things with 2020 where it's like, you know what? Our sanity is... <laughs> precious and having that meter for every day and it just sounds like you you took that and you turned that into a module and i am so on board (laughs) um in our chat room sorry i think something got in my eye um our chat room is having a a field day with it (laughs) like um not always weak was like oh great this is um what is it? Um, I'll just write a Chimera module that's like, what do I hate most? Okay, make it a game. <laughs> <laughs> put it in a blender. There you go. <laughs> yeah, so what, what do you fear the most? Oh, just put them all in one place. And then they're the thing that you're, that you're, that's chasing you. And to be fair, like a lot of the morale stuff was part of the system to begin with. But to Alex's point, the idea was to actually show you what that actually looks like in practice. 
because it's easy to say, yeah, morale is yeah. important, but you know, in reality is if it's just not, if you're not given a way to actually explain how that actually, how that functions, then it's just kind of like, well, it's a sandbox. I'm not like any other that you can just ignore. And you can, you can ignore morale completely if you want to, but I think it's such a crucial element because you're playing, if you're playing yourself, especially like you you only got one life. You're not going to like go charging into a dark corridor, assuming you're going to come out alive. Like, you're, okay, you know what? Maybe I'm reached my wits end. I'm going to be done. And then going back home and crying a little bit. Well, I think that's one of the interesting things that the Strain series kind of shows as well is that the reason why the core game of Outbreak was such a sandbox is that there's so many different ways that you can kind of approach this. And the approach that you take is going to potentially have drastic ramifications on what you end up having as your kind of focal point as you move through the game. So like, for instance, Chimera, since it does lean so heavily into some of that real grotesque horror, morale just is, becomes a focal point uh, mechanic that you really can't really avoid anymore at that point. Um, so it kind of brings a highlight to it. And I think that each of the Strain series does manage to kind of accomplish that in different ways with different things, because that's, that's kind of the nature of an outbreak is that it does really kind of change things up drastically just by making small little tweaks here and there. Yeah, I, <laughs> those are excellent points, um, Alex. And I've just, uh, the chat room has me like <laughs> giggling. Um, Jules does stuff 15, take what you fear and give it human skin. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's like, oh my God. No. Oh, I love it. In 2011, or just leave the skin off and have all the insides bits open to the air. <laughs> This is the conversation that we See, have signed on. Yeah, and that's the that's the trick, y'all, is uh, that Chris is still technically has the ability to write more stuff. So if you keep giving him ideas right now, you might just be making your own nightmares come true. Oh, oh yeah, my I mean, God. Cat room. If you want to do like a body horror wish bucket real quick, like a chum bucket of wishes. Oh, stop it. Body horror wish. <laughs> do it in the chat. I'm telling you, we're we're gonna add this into the conversation. What if the bucket See, itself is made of flesh? Oh, stop it! Do it! Keep going. Teeth around the rim. Oh well, my god! Obviously, no. And another thing, and as far as like you're talking about what kind of elements come into it, I, I think that if you're cognizant, and you're infected, and you or are aware of the genetic malleability that comes with this, you start to like. There's gonna be there's like a class of flesh crafters who basically try to one up each other. And what they can come up with as far as like how much can i do and yeah. that's i mean it's not unlike if anyone here is familiar with 40k it's not like the, unlike the homoculus from the the Jurikari, um that sort of thing it's like yeah. they they take pride in their creation so they're very they're not like shambling zombies or mindless slaves they're like i want to make this thing and i want to make it as grand as possible and so they craft these my david yeah exactly and so they craft these things and like they, they and there's there's stats for like very distinct varying kinds of their creations and and the and the and the crafters themselves and there's a bit of a story behind it it does kind of work tangentially to other lore we've used so there is not it's not just like well they just kind of came up with this on their own um they there's like there was a society that kind of built up around it and they kind of went on tried to one-up each other um but the but the first the, the first homo homoculus if you like what, what i call them they were homoculus like this because of the reference they, call, um, they were the hierophants the first hierophants were basically the, is actually did nothing did nothing to herself because no because no one's hands were trained enough to do a good job of it so basically she created the whole first generation and they kept trying to one up each other after that and then she's like was so disgusted with the fact that she couldn't perfect what she was trying to do that she just kind of left and uh left basically left the the the, the wake and like the the the, pro, like the the whole um that struggle amongst each other so it's a bit so it's got its own society that's kind of built up around this now at some point in time their minds just go and but whatever comes of that before then well that's that's half the fun uh just to stumble upon what they've come up with and going up on their 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 laboratories or their uh their studios if you will uh and see what kind of things that they left behind Dueling Frankenstein's. Yes, <laughs> There's Damn some right. nasty stuff in there already too. It's uh, I've I've gotten to parse through it, and Chris has come up with some 
twisted creations that are I, I now be... I'm imagining these two competing Frankensteins as like Pokemon trainers and they're just trying to make <laughs> the most disturbing Cronenberg Pokemon to battle each other. Oh, but that's the thing. It's it, to them that they're beautiful. They're not disturbing yeah. at all. This is their expression of art and it's they're yeah. basically bringing the dredges into their understanding of how beautiful they are and how the wonderful the things they do are so, so there's a little, a little like, bit of uh, vicissitude in in uh, the world of darkness the you know the, <laughs> yeah it's the clan of the dragon there you go doing their stuff yeah i love that i mean <laughs> why is it that i want to play characters like that i think this is why i end up running games sometimes is because those don't work as well as player concepts it's better it's <laughs> well, better you, as you a gotta bad find guy. the right group you know, you gotta, <laughs> yeah the group's gotta be just as sadistic as you and then you realize that you all probably need help <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, our chat room's having like a field day with this uh and then also uh just a couple of the body horror wish buckets uh jules does stuff 15 spider egg sacks but they're tiny humans oh god that's horrible it's just like <sighs> i can picture like the little mouths for me it's that's... mouths <sighs> mouths teeth and like eye stuff no that's like that's enough for me dog <laughs> <I'm out. laughs> well, i did submit for this a few of the pieces that anthony jones had done and it does have a lot of those things that you like so much just then like the watchers especially kind of had that to the t to the up to the nines so it's going to be a lot of fun to see how you feel about those <laughs> i think okay. we're showing some of that right i now, hate it actually. already <laughs> are we I yeah i think some of that is being shown right now no, Anthony awesome. Jones is so great. <laughs> yeah, there are a number. There are a number of comments where they're like, um, uh, with some of the artwork that we have up. Uh, for instance, uh, there was um, oh, Scabby Rooster, Necromancers, but they're bros. <laughs> <laughs> right, bromancers. Yeah, yeah bro not always stuff. weak. Got to catch them all and then stitch them all together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as you do. <laughs> as you do. I, I didn't know where I was going when I started this, but I'm on a path I have to keep at. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, and thank you, uh, Thea underscore Hyperion. It's like, I'm with Marquia there. I can't do eyes. There's, why, why, why do so many things? Do you remember The Strain, like that TV yeah. show? And literally the graphic for the show were things crawling out of the eye. Yeah. I'm like, is that necessary? It's not. Those worms can exist anywhere, but you did that to, to attack me. <laughs> I love that show. I love the hell out of that show. I mean, oh, it was I, good. But uh, yeah, I, I know what you mean. Okay, hey, well, I think- It's, it's I interesting think... when you bring that up because it, it reminds me that of like, that's Guillermo del Toro, right? And he yeah. did Blade Two, And so his take, I think, on, on vampires kind of took it off in a different direction. And I think that you can do that a lot with these things, like whether it's- different types of undead or monsters is you can change their silhouette in a way and it totally it's a totally different you know type of monster yeah oh very true okay um uh, we're we will be talking more about chimera but i think we've gotten a really good grasp of what um we're going to be continuing for with that so how about let's uh pivot a little bit and go into the world of dance macabre so uh alquin if you can let us know what is Dance Macabre? What is this bringing to the table? We need to know. Inquiring minds need to know. Um, Dance Macabre is an alternate historical survival horror game. So it's the outbreak undead that you know and love, but it is centuries ago. It is in the, the mid 14th century during the Black Death, during the, at that point, the largest apocalyptic event that uh, Europeans ever experienced. Um, so it, it's, it's imagine playing Outbreak Undead, but you know, the, what, a, what, a, what's in a first aid kit is very, very different. You're dealing with a, a world that doesn't know anything about microbiology or antiseptic. Um, in fact, a lot of the, the sort of emerging theories of medicine, they exist. They exist in like medical texts that you might be able to get from, you know, the Near East or the Middle East. Um, but most people just don't really understand a lot of the sort of biological drivers that uh, the characters usually in a horror game would know, you know, about how disease spreads. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty different in a lot of ways. Um, and the behavior of the, 
of the antagonists in this. Um, they're they're called revenants in Dance Macabre because zombies are uh, z- zombie itself is a, is a later you know Caribbean uh, thing. It's not it's not in the lexicon at that time. Um, so they don't the people don't necessarily see them. Uh, they don't have this recognizable uh, popular culture to fall back on of what a, what a zombie is. You know, so to them they they look like uh, they think that they're you know demons. Or I guess some people think that maybe they're, you know, a representation of God's displeasure, you know. Cool. Um, I mean, you look at a lot of the people at that time and how they thought about what the Black Death was, you know, and they're, they related it to the conjunction of planets and the stars. You know, they had their own ideas about alchemy um, and all these other things. And so they were kind of trying to make sense of, of uh you know, of, of, of disease. And in this case, both after the Black Death, uh, during while well, the Black Death is happening, you've got people, uh, you know, rising and becoming these revenants. Um, and they don't look like traditional zombies either. They're very shriveled. They look like skeletons. Um, a lot of our inspiration for it was to, uh, oh dear, it looks like I messed up my camera here. What happened? Um, uh, can you guys see my video? I think I accidentally toggled off my video. Oh, um, yeah, I think it. There oh, you are. Oh, what? it went. It went away again. Hold on. And now okay. you're there. There you are. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. No, that's fine. Um, they don't. They don't actually, want. They want. Don't want this to get out. Um. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, actually, there there was a there was a question uh, from our from our chat and. Um, also, uh, JBR Tech Wizard, if uh, it's possible to like grab some questions from chat. I think this was the, the first one that it came up and I know y'all have questions if, and just go ahead and ask. There is no question that's too far out there because we're getting into the spooky season. Go ahead, do that, do that. Give us your, um, your wish bucket for things that you wanna happen in either of these uh, strain series also. But this is from uh, Thea Hyperion to you, Alquin. Um, okay, does it have the humors? Uh, can I be some sort of healer trying to balance humors? Yeah, um, in fact, a, a lot of the design for the, the revenants themselves are divided up uh, by humors. So even though there are a lot of scientific theories at the time, which we know now as a contemporary audience are not real, um, the people in the, in, the, uh, in the world would classify these creatures by these different uh, humors by their different dispositions of being, you know, choleric or sanguine. So uh, the design for the revenants themselves, some of it is based around a lot of kind of archetypal uh, European folkloric stuff. Um, You know, you've got your kind of grim reaper types or your sort of headless horsemen or like sort of four horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, You know, that we, I like this idea of these sort of skeleton knights who are fused to these skeletal horses, um, but yeah, every, everything everything is described as far as its different subtypes in in being different different balances of humors. Um, you you are breeding you are bringing up some really great things that reminds me of uh, medieval times and also you know like getting medieval on your ass that kind of that kind of stuff. <laughs> I'm I'm feeling like this comes from your background as a creator in general. Can you share some of that with like where is this medieval love coming from? Um, my parents are university professors and they taught a bunch of subjects, but they started out doing uh, medieval studies. So I've grown up with a, with a lot of stuff around this. And part of me wanting to do this was, I feel like when people play a fantasy game, uh, they have a kind of baseline for what they expect middle ages uh, settings to be. Um, and it's really just kind of like, they want things that are very recognizable. You know, they like, they like the castles and the dragons and the armor and all these sort of things. Um, and we're gonna have all of those things, but we're trying to treat it more um, in both how the world is like socially, uh, but also as far as people's like occupations and worldview and beliefs and all that, it's we're trying to go down to something that's realistically historical horror, as opposed to, I mean, of course there's a supernatural element in it. I mean, there are ways that you could explain away with with contemporary science what's going on um, with, but to the people at the time, it seems like a you know like some dark magic basically um 
but yeah, we want to have all the stuff that, that people would expect if they were to play Outbreak Undead um, at that time. Uh, I think of things like, like Army of Darkness or like the uh, Harryhausen stop motion animation with, you know, armies of skeletons and those kind of things. So we're, we're trying to pivot to something that's a little bit different um, from your typical uh, zombie stuff, you know, because I mean, if people want the base version of Outbreak Undead, they're going to be able to design their own worlds for that. But I think with these strain series ones, I like that it's being pushed off into directions where you're like, wow, this is the same game. These are like both so different, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Um, I love that you brought up uh, social changes and you even used the term real historical uh, facts, like real historical data. And I know that um, because of more contemporary historical retellings, that it appears that there's only certain demographics um, that exist in certain countries at a time. Um, are you addressing that with uh, yeah. Dance Macabre? And if so, in what way? Um, yeah, that's another one of the big things um, in doing the research for this, um, which I did a lot of before I really got started. The one thing that really struck me is how there, you know, you can see Europe depicted as being very, you know, white, male, straight, you know, but then if when you dig into the actual history, you, it, you're not really stretching or making too many, you know, wild inferences by seeing the influence of women, uh, non-binary people, uh, people of color. Uh, it's just that a lot of our history has erased them, basically, um, which is great for a contemporary audience who wants to play this game. I mean, a lot of the players for this game are not necessarily gonna be white guys, you know, European guys. So we have to, in, in finding a place for players to be able to see themselves reflected in the world, it's not making it up. Like those people were in Europe at the time, you know? Um, you can, especially part of the, the scenarios I'm writing take place in these sort of Italian city-states, which were very cosmopolitan uh, at the time, you know, and had people from Africa and the Middle East and Asia uh, in them. And that's, that's a fact, like we know that, you know? So it isn't, it isn't that it's politically correct or social justice warrior or anything. And we're not inserting anybody in there. Like they were always there. You know, and nope. so, and if people are going to play uh, a survival horror game, they're going to need to get all the help they can get, all the knowledge they can get, all the, you know, unity they can to live through this. Because, you know, when there's a procession of people wearing nothing but, you know, skeletons wearing tattered shrouds, ringing bells, marching down a city street and, you know, speaking strange Latin masses and, you know, flagellating themselves, like you, you you got to handle that first, you know? And uh, so I think a lot of people are going to be, especially, I don't, people don't need to go into it thinking, would I have been in this universe or like, would I have known these things? And it's like, well, maybe you're the, maybe you're one of the first, maybe you're one of the people who, you know, would figure out something like, Hey, I, I think that we shouldn't be, you know, uh, getting our drinking water right next to the place where we leave butchered animal carcasses, you know? Um, <laughs> Maybe you should change the straw in your bed once in a while so you don't get, you know, fleas biting you and giving you the bubonic plague. But, um, but yeah, that was one of the things we really thought about was like, if you're a contemporary, if you're part of our modern world, why would you want to, why would you want to play in this world, you know, um, because so much of it is so forbidding, you know, when you've got, I mean, people talk about like, you know, the, the 1% and those sort of things now, but like, Back then, it was even it was as sharp a delineation. You know, you've got you've got the nobility at the very top, and some of the clergy and stuff, the first and second estates, and then everybody else are these peasants. You know, basically who don't. Um, you know, the the world is changing. It's become people are starting to move to cities, and you know, they're the sort of seeds of of the Renaissance coming. Um, and one of the things that the Black Death did for Europe was by killing a lot of people it created it changed the value of labor you know so we're looking at a lot of that kind of stuff and it but it, just, it gets so scary when you think about like what if in the in the after this apocalypse happens you know and the dead rise maybe the dead take the place of a lot of the you know the, the space that would be taken up by that would have allowed people to to grow and for there to be a middle class and all these sort of things so we're, we're trying to think about in some ways, like what the social significance of 
you know, because it, it starts out as being probably fairly faithful but the, to, to our history. But then the, the minute the players are in that world and making decisions, you know, and, and you've got these revenants doing what they're doing, you know, it, it, it starts to diverge. So Alex and I have talked about some of the crazier stuff that we'd like to see. And we're like, hmm, that, that's, that's too much for this book. We have saved that for a future book. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you know what? That brings up a really good question that our chat then had. Um, Pinguini11 asks, um, are there, well, are there plague doctors in, Dan in dance? And then also, I want skeletal centaur looking mofos jousting, please. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I tried to think of a lot of the stuff that people would want to have um, in there, and jousting is definitely part of it. Like the sort of the manor system and a, a lot of stuff that was happening in England is really interesting. Stuff from the Hundred Years' War. I've learned more about differences in crossbows and types of uh, medieval mercenaries, you know, through the research for this than you, you could imagine. Um, sometimes you do stumble on things like, uh, like the you know, the plague doctor stuff. A lot of what we see is the sort of plague doctor types is actually from a later period, but there are some places where we have taken a little bit of uh, kind of artistic license because things seem so directly related just to kind of, you know, historical plague uh, things. And there certainly were uh, plague doctors at the time. So yeah, we will, we definitely will have the, you know, the folks with the masks, the beaked masks stuffed with uh, herbs and perfumes and all that. Um, going through and, and deciding uh, how a lot of the medicine is going to work in the system was very interesting. So you like in a normal outbreak undead, you, you talk about like, oh, I, you know, my first aid kit is depleted, you know, I need to get more bandages of this type. And so a lot of the narrative elements are, are, are different, um, even if the, the framework of the mechanics for how a first aid kit works, you know, in this yeah. setting, it might, it might be a healer's kit that has alchemy and herbalism kind of stuff in it. You know? Yeah, and like jars of leeches, I would assume. <laughs> yeah. here, here's like the, you know, here, here's the leeches that is like, oh, these are dependable, like a Volvo. So these are like Volvo leeches, you know, this is how much you'll have to spend for them. And here's the Lamborghini leeches. Yes. So, you know, these work all the time, but do you have enough gold <laughs> to be able to afford, you know, this brand of leeches? That's what I'm picturing right now. Yeah, well, I mean, you've got... The first medical stuff that, that anybody would have, and this is true for people who are dying of plague uh, as well, the first person you go to is someone at home, you know, maybe your mother or grandmother or, or something. They're the ones who know how to make healing pol poultices or cook you foods that have these appropriate herbs in them that have been passed down for generations of like, okay, if you're sick, you do this. So these sort of, you know, local folk remedies. Um, but then, you know, when it doesn't go away and you need to get a second opinion, maybe if you've got the money, you can go visit an apothecary, you know, um, and an apothecary might have stuff that they've learned from, you know, Greek medical texts or Arabic medical texts. Uh, they might have access to more hard to find ingredients that they've gotten through trade through other parts, even places outside of Europe. Um, but to actually get to the people who are what we, what we would call doctors today, um, you know, those are, that's a very small group of people of like, you know, there are not very many universities yet. Um, you know, the University of Paris is kind of like the central place where people seem to know the most about the plague. But if you read the medical texts from and letters that these doctors wrote to each other at the times, you'd be like, wow, you were so wrong about this. I mean, bless your heart. You're trying to, you know, help people in the plague or whatever. But some of their theories are just like, well, you know, obviously Mars was in the second house of this. And that's why... I mean, people are trying to explain their environment, you know, right before the Black Death, there's this thing called the, the, the Little Ice Age, which is like, they just have this thing which there's rain and cold and it just kills crops in, in this incredible way. And it's, it's interesting to see like social stuff and climate stuff and all these things. It was, it was just so terrible, you know? And I find a lot of stuff that, to relate for like what our world is like today, like going through a pandemic as to how these people were dealing with stuff in 1347, you know? Oh my gosh. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, in some ways it's been kind of hard to work on this book during- It seems, you know, a, little, it seems a little close, doesn't it? it seems, yeah. You know, 
just just a little bit actually both of your projects seem a little bit close uh, <laughs> Where, how's my close <laughs> i mean okay z- okay zombie zombie to me i will like- tell you <laughs> It's 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 because you know, like I said before, sanity is precious. Right. Okay. Was, the the I, very fact that you have um, where you know your morale has to be your strongest connecting thing with this, but also going out into this world, we're having even puppies. <laughs> puppies can be puppies. You, God, you did this to puppies, where it's just like, oh my gosh, look at this sweet little corgi, and you know, like you go up to the corgi and then you you try to pet it, and then it's like that that little dog in chapter. Uh, was it in chapter one of it where it's just like behind the not so scary door oh. and then like the dog is just like Rah. i mean i thought you were going to talk about the dog from full metal alchemist if we're talking about Ch- chimera stop and it. melding things you together. stop it right now <laughs> <laughs> yes that's why you really wanted to make this game chris is so you can you're, reenact that part from full metal alchemist you know what the thing is i didn't even see that till like maybe five or six months ago i've never seen it and then my wife's like oh you should see this show i was like oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm kind of like past the wife. anime thing. <laughs> oh, she's yeah, she's great. Her, she's, cor- her corrupting influence is excellent. No, and, and she, when we hit that, was like, I'm done. I don't want to watch this show anymore. Uh, I didn't go. I didn't go back to it for like a couple of weeks after that. I still didn't even finish it. There's a lot of episodes. Yeah, did you did you make it up to the hum- homunculi? Um, uh, in it because you were talking about the before, and the first thing I thought of was Full Metal. Really? No, I did not make it that far. Oh, I, now really? I'm going to have to watch it for due diligence. Great. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the Brotherhood version, you can watch just that. And oh, there, really? There are multiple versions of it. I think the Brotherhood is, is probably the best one. It's the one that's closest to the manga. So. Yeah. Great. Thanks, yeah. guys. Thanks for the development notes. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, yeah. Speaking, there, speaking of uh, morale, and you know, Alex and I have had these conversations about how an, an outbreak undead, it is easier to break somebody with using the morale rules than it is to kill them using damage yeah. thresholds and all that sort of stuff. Um, and it's also more interesting in a narrative way to get, have something happen to them which they can empathize with as players than just like, oh, I slowly ground ground you down with injuries, you know? Um, so the morale well, stuff the, is great. The morale too, like the really great thing about it for me is... I always see like a lot of GMs struggle with, they're like, well, how do you get the players to come back to the more uh, grounded things that would be going on in the apocalypse and not just be completely focused on the zombies from a player perspective? And and morale is how you do it because the way you fix morale in this game is by having like counseling sessions between yeah, characters the coping mechanisms and right? dealing yeah like with the coping mechanisms that your disadvantages might provide you so indulging a very bad habit to try to block out the the terrible things that are happening around you or even just getting like there there's some in some cases like preacher comforts like getting a a good book that's of the genre that you like and actually dedicating time to reading it like these kind of actions will end up having to come up if you're actually as the gm actively working on wearing down their psyche um and yeah i think both of these systems are uh, both these settings are wildly primed for that yeah Yeah, the the coping mechanisms be very different in them uh but that's kind of cool. I mean, I think that gives players yeah. immediately like, okay, I have a, there's a story here, you know, for me. Yeah, uh, uh, Chris, I'm kind of uh, curious here um, because, like, I, I'm 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 interested in making some core system comparisons and deviations from mm-hmm. people that have played Outbreak Undead and the what you know how this would work for them with like these uh, particular versions of Strain series. Mm-hmm. So with your with your uh, with your module, uh, I'm sorry, I, ke- I keep on saying module. Um, with, uh, That's a classic. I, I call them modules know, sometimes right? too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with with Chimera, so with disadvantages and with these creature comforts, like how is that going to work within within the world of Chimera, um, where it's like literally anything anything could just turn into like a body horror thing that then just like sends you reeling from the room. Well, it's, it's more along the application of it. It's not so much what, what works and what doesn't because the system that's in there is always kind of been there. It's not like I'm making this up for the sake of Chimera. Um, it's just, it's just basically exploring it. Cause basically how is, how it's described in the, in the core book is that, you know, you run out of morale, 
bad things happen. Either the party breaks, you fail your mission, and you got to go back and lick your wounds and reassess many, many, many things. Um, in Chimera, the difference is that there's more things that actually like really injure your morale. And so um, in, in the core book, I believe it was just the Banshee was the one that was mainly designed to whittle away your morale more, more than most because uh, the Banshees basically weren't physically very strong, but they were a, a psychological threat. Um, whereas in Chimera, pretty much everything's a psychological threat. It's, there's no non-psychological threat to be had. They're all, all the encounters are bad with them. Like you're not going to get around it without being really rattled by what you saw. Um, as far as how coping mechanisms go, um, I don't see it as being too different. Um, and maybe I'm selling it short, but I really don't see it as being an, nothing but an, an uh, kind of how we, we see these strange stories to begin with, explaining the world as we explain the rules in the book, just we're giving you a practical place to, to, to do it. So I don't think yeah. there's a difference in how you express yourself or how you um, God, what's the one I'm looking for? How you cope with things, because the person's the same, and that's the, that's the takeaway: is that we are all humans in these worlds. So you're reacting this as a human would. So having it be a disadvantage um, that is that leads to a coping mechanism of some kind. That's meant to be part of the human condition that's being described. Like, you know, someone who's really violent may not be maybe fine mostly, but that's how they get, that's how they cope with, with, with stress is just by being really violent. Um, so it's stuff like that. It's like, you're basically explaining by means of like a stressor, what these people are doing. And my background's in psychology. So a lot of this stuff is, is, is a uh, part of my, the background thinking of how I come up with this stuff. It's like, what are these people doing to kind of blow off steam? And is it a healthy way of doing it? Or is it a harmful way of doing it? Because what happens is, in, um, when, and I even said this in the book, is that if you have a character that has no, no, um, no disadvantages or no, um, I guess you would call them personality flaws, but I think that's a little bit dismissive. But if you have these, you can, you can be like this, this you know, artificial version of a human being who doesn't have any any sort of like psychological failure but they have no way of, of preventing the loss of morale they will just be broken really quickly so what happens is when you make a character that has a, a deeper level of complexity with regards to how they handle stress it becomes a more interesting character to play and becomes a more relatable one um, that people can uh, can wrap their heads around you know it's it's that's the way it's meant to that's the way it was designed so when, when it goes to Chimera, it's not so much that the COVID mechanisms change or that the, the methods have changed at all. It's that what's causing them has changed because it's just so pervasive. Yeah, I, I guess what I was seeing with it um, is that the way that it would be different with like um, just comparing it to like the core system of Outbreak Undead is that it feels like to me, and I keep on bringing it back to 2020, where it's just like having all of these different stressors that can happen, no matter whether it's physical stressors or not, but just these psychological stressors and having a world be more comprised of that, then has you have your character where it it literally has to where you you have to you have to contain and you have to be even more gentle and kind with yourself as a character. Like you literally have to, uh, I don't want to use the term bubble, but you have to be aware of your meter more. Mm -hmm. Like you would, you, in a, in a game where it's just like, oh, you know, there can be zombies anywhere, but I can listen out for them. And, you know, I've got my gun and I've got this and I've, you know, I've got my hand scythe and, and such and such. You know, I'm going to go up the dark, you know, the dark stairs into into the next room to find the medical supplies. While if it's something like all this psychological, like literally you could be walking up the stairway and one of the stairs could be something that is about to leap out at you. you it's not these humanoid zombies that you're looking at. It's mm -hmm. like this this part of the wall could have been something that was there for like forever oh, and then now it. it's formed into the wall yeah <laughs> you see your little brother's face the staircase oh, is made of people yeah. you know exactly. I, I that's think, uh honestly uh, and this is just kind of tying into some of what chris was already getting at with it is that 
uh chimera and zom v specifically i don't think they really dive too much into like deviations uh from what you would find in the core rule book they provide you with different ways to look at that information and each one of them does kind of take a different focal point with chimera definitely really ratcheting in on the morale factor of it with the on the flip side zombie was really more leaning into the fact that we have a whole like disease system uh that we have for the game and since it was a, a more viral type outbreak that was in that one you had to have the same issues that you do with the 2020 situation of like if a person catches a cold and they start showing these symptoms those are still very similar symptoms to this other thing that we're very worried about and now you have to have things like quarantines and stuff like that so they just they focus in on different existing facets of the outbreak system um which is why i think that dance macabre and uh what we're not we're not really focusing on it so much in this one in particular uh but deep space those two do dive into some more deviation uh which is kind of some of what i think you were getting at there uh Marquia. um solely due to the types of settings that they are one being sci-fi and then one going back to ancient times like there does actually have to be some deviation from the core game uh in the way that's presented oh excellent and then um alex we we did have a really good question from chat um yeah. uh, regarding both properties it's from a thea underscore hyperion uh, and are these two games scheduled for 2021 or do are these more like we're not quite certain but they will be coming Gotcha. So Chimera, actually, um, we're hoping to have the digital version of that out still this year, actually, in 2020. Um, so that one digitally should be coming just right around the corner. Um, we do have some uh, last bits of writing that we want to touch up on there. Um, much like with Zombie, we want to take Chimera to that global scale. Um, and so we are working with some uh, writers who are going to be more localized to various regions of the world to provide that kind of personal touch uh, to their parts of the outbreak. Um, so we do need to get that finished up and then there is still some additional layout and some final editing that has to go on with that. Um, but again, we are shooting for the digital on that one this year. Um, again with these strain series we may very well do print runs at some point in the future but those will come out a little bit later. Um, then Dance Macabre and then uh, Deep Space as well, those will both be coming out in 2021. Um, and that's both digitally and potential print runs for those. So you do have some right around the corner uh, and then you've got some stuff to look forward to long-term as well. Okay, well, uh, Alex, just give us a quick little taste about Deep Space with what we're thinking about with that. And then uh, yeah. I would love, a couple of uh, scenarios from uh, Chimera and Dance Macabre, like just like, a, hey, this is a, a little scene that you could expect within this world. Oh, that should be fun. Um, so yeah, uh, with Deep Space, uh, I think one of the writers is actually hanging out in the chat right now. I haven't Ooh. updated it in a second. Nice. Uh, yeah, uh, and I'll do a little bit of a call out on him just to, to make them a little embarrassed. Uh, Brittany is uh, in there as Violet 040609. Um, that is uh, one of the writers actually uh, for uh, Deep Space, as well as uh, Brian Green, who's done, uh, if you've gone to our live shows and stuff like that, you've probably run into both Brittany and Brian in the past. They are uh, very frequent GMs for us. Um, Brittany's actually running some of our Roll20 Con uh, demos this weekend as well. Um, and what they're actually doing with Deep Space is kind of interesting. So uh, originally Deep Space was conceived as kind of a standalone game uh, apart from Outbreak Undead, but still utilizing the same like core systems and things like that. Uh, but now we're putting it into the Strain series uh, mold here. And by doing that, what that means is we want to provide a setting, whereas the first version of Deep Space was a sandbox, uh, much like Outbreak Undead, the core rules are, to let you kind of present any kind of uh, a sci-fi type of outbreak that you wanted to play around with. Um, 
now while obviously the book will also give you that ability because it's going to put all these sci-fi tools in your hand it's also going to present you with a coherent setting um so there will be a, a kind of specific outbreak that's going on in deep space but you can easily deviate from that if you want to and just kind of take the uh sci-fi trappings that are going to be coming from that and utilize those to make your own creepy horrible uh sci-fi madness in the game so yeah that should be uh pretty fun <laughs> i oh i love that we're just like hey so you you hate this thing uh we're gonna give you this thing <laughs> you this thing we we got you <laughs> yeah. welcome to the world of the survival horror genre <laughs> we're yeah, gonna we're gonna bring it home it's it's funny because the uh, deep space is this is obviously for those who are fans of ours from the long term this is actually our our first as Alex said it was a standalone uh, tangentially related to Outbreak Undead but it was but at first deep space was a module about Outbreak Undead then it became a standalone and now it's becoming a module again yep. it's like it's it's leapfrogged <laughs> over <laughs> itself. <laughs> <laughs> exactly it leaped off it's, it's that property more than the other ones we've done have leapfrogged over themselves um because like basically uh deep early deep is it's very clearly a proto second edition and then now we're doing the new deep space that's gonna have the refinement of whatever second editions foibles had and probably borrow a few things from the altered carbon mechanics as well because that's a sci-fi setting so why not for the vehicles for sure that'd be great <laughs> yeah i mean that and the oh, tech yeah. point system because actually the tech point yeah. system was conceived in outbreak deep space like that's basically mm -hmm. lifted and then given a lot of polish and then put into put into altered carbon so yeah, having i can definitely to... say that they've uh they nabbed a few of your deep or uh altered carbon ideas for uh uh, deep space there that at least the ones that blended uh, really nicely um, so one that I'll actually just go ahead and kind of throw out there uh, just to give some people behind the scenes stuff uh, is now in Outbreak Undead we don't play around with economy very much or currency uh, too terribly much just because the whole premise is supposed to be it society's fallen apart um, now you can quick hand wave a lot of that stuff based on oh you've got like five hundred dollars in your bank account or something like that and you want to go and buy something at the store before the store collapses well we could get roughly figure out whether or not that would be possible um but when you move into the far future you need kind of a, a system to be able to address that so we we they definitely stole the uh wealth level and uh uh system with that uh price level system uh on equipment so that way you can kind of have a, a nice fluid method of doing it without getting like nickel and diming uh, essentially um which some games out there do and uh some that is preferred play style in some cases um but even though outbreak has always been very simulation based um one of the things that chris has done a fantastic job with is being able to still do that while abstracting some stuff so that you don't have to do that just ridiculous level of note keeping like our depletion system for instance to find out if things run out of stuff just kind of throw in a depletion point on something roll in some d6 we don't necessarily worry about during the intent of oh i fire five bullets no you fire your gun and it could have been two bullets it might have been one bullet that was just really well placed something like that um and then we find out if you eventually go over the capacity uh so yeah there's there's some elegance to that and uh we've definitely adopted some things that we've come up with for the deep space property. Oh, 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 y'all have got me. Y'all, y'all know I'm already a horror fanatic. And this is just, <laughs> this is a lot of the spoopy that I, I really want. And it's like spoopy and then like hardcore spoopy, which I, I guess would be called spooky, but we'll go with hardcore spoopy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, with all of this. So um, I would love uh, for you to just like paint a scene, um, uh, you know, with words, uh, you don't have to pull it out anything. I know Chris is a painter. So he's like, you know, put the paint yeah. set down. But um, Alquin, could you like just paint a scene for us with what we, something that we could expect with like Dance Macabre? Um, well, I can talk about some of the kind of images and situations that are going to be in the the scenarios which will be in the book Heck um yes and they and start out 
Also, I, I know Scabby Rooster had a, a personal request. Please give us leeches. So I know I just. Oh, wanted... leeches are in there. Yeah, leeches are, are oh, leeches yeah. are in your first aid kits, your healer's kits in in, uh, in Dance Macabre. <laughs> um, what I'm going to do with these scenes, though, is I'm going to start describing them, and while you listen to them. Tell me when you think it's something original that I've come up with, or or if you think it's just entirely a real thing that happened. Oh my gosh, chat room, you got to get in on this too. All right, let us know. Um, so let's start out by talking about like when the Black Plague uh, first entered Europe in uh, the city of Kaffa on the the Black Sea. This is a, a trading port um, which was used primarily by the Genoese, who are uh, from the city of Genoa, the Italian city state. Uh, so they were in conflict with uh, the Golden Horde, who were Tatars, who were uh, uh, people who were uh, attacking them outside the, the city. This is a walled city. Uh, and the Tatars eventually came down with the bubonic plague themselves. Um, a lot of this is where it, it started, you know, where the, the Yersinia pestis bacterium moved from uh, rodents in the desert uh, in the high deserts of Asia into rats uh, like the black rat uh, and brown rat uh, that were in Europe. Um, so there's a siege going on and the Golden Horde, uh, they get sick uh, with this disease, but then they end up launching the bodies of their dead over the walls into Kaffa. Uh, basically in one of, one of the first depictions uh, of biological warfare at that time. Yes. So yeah. Put your plague-ridden corpses in catapults and launch them over the walls to drive out your enemy. So that's all a real thing that happened. I'm not yeah, making yeah, up yeah, any no. of that. Yeah, that is, that is a real thing. Um, yeah, it makes me in, think of the, um, um, well, it makes me think of two things. Uh, you know, the plague blankets uh, that uh, America, like America. Smallpox, yeah. Yeah, for smallpox blankets. And then it also <laughs> makes me think of Monty Python and the Holy Grail. <laughs> Yes. When the cat, when the cow, like. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So let's follow uh, those. Let's follow those blankets and stuff. Nice. <laughs> we can follow those same blankets. They, these don't have smallpox on them. These have, instead, they have uh, fleas on them. And those fleas have uh, been on these rats that have the, the bubonic plague bacteria in their system. Um, so these fleas, they, they get this Yersinia pestis uh, bacterium in them and it causes a blockage in their feeding tract. Uh, and this makes them more agitated. Uh, so they get, these fleas get angrier and they, they, they tend to go harder and, and try to end up in places they're not supposed to be. And a lot of fleas that wouldn't normally bite humans are just so hungry you know, for blood at that point because their systems are blocked with this, with this bubonic plague bacteria. So they go and bite people, and then they regurgitate this blockage of bacterium into the bloodstream. Oh, and that's dude. how this, <laughs> this conversation now. <laughs> this is a horror game. I thought you said you wanted a horror game. Please continue. <laughs> this, is, this is like, this is hardcore. This is hardcore. So now you, you've got sailors, right? You've got these Genoese yeah. sailors, and they're going to go back to the Italian city states. They might stop off in Sicily. Uh, you know, they're going to go around the big boot and they're going to they're going to try to land uh, in places like Genoa um, and some places uh, turn them away. Uh, and another one of our scenarios, the ones that deals with the stuff in the Italian city states, that's the thing is you've got a ship full of these sick people. Uh, and then maybe later on, maybe it's a sick full uh, uh, a ship full of, you know, revenant people. Uh, revenant monsters instead of instead of these uh these sick people i mean that's where the word quarantine comes from is when they would make these ships stay for 40 days you know but it doesn't happen everywhere some people let the ships in and i think in in our in our story and a lot of storytellers how they tell it they're going to want the ships to get in so could you <laughs> could you imagine fight trying to fight off uh a, you know a galleon full of these shriveled skeletons you know with crossbows and you know, Greek fire and, and all this sort of stuff. And they're trying to make a landing in your medieval port city and you have to stop them. I mean, the plague is already raging through your city. So. Oh my, wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I thought the fleas were bad enough. And then it just like kind of, <laughs> it, keeps, it keeps escalating. It's like, um, and I and I love our chat rooms like um, uh, all about it too. <laughs> oh my gosh. This is, <laughs> How did we survive? It's like <laughs> yeah, that's that's wow. a, it, it's kind of difficult. I know a lot of us didn't, but 
Um, and kind of like what Chris was talking about with Chimera, like you don't necessarily hammer on the same uh, points when it comes for how you use tension and dread and, and stuff in horror. And it doesn't always have to be the same as far as its pacing. Uh, we give a lot of freedom uh, to like, if you do, you want to do a slow burn that has very, you maybe you don't see these revenants until the climactic scene in, in your scenario that you discover that's so much worse than the Black Plague. I mean, or maybe that's just the starting point for you. Maybe you start your scenario uh, in a place like, uh, you know, uh, what would become France in the Hundred Years' War, the beginning of the Hundred Years' War. But in this case, you've got, instead of Burgundians trying to fight, you know, uh, people from uh, Languedoc or, you know, the, the French and the English going at it over these different, uh, you know, dukedoms and counties that they're fighting over. Uh, what if some of them are having to, you know, ally against armies of the dead, you know, that are out in the field, you know, and then you've got a lot of this sort of, we're inspired a lot by the, a lot of the medieval art of the period of just being like, you know, those things where they show, you got stuff like Hans Holbein, the younger, uh, he's very famous woodblock prints called the dance of the dead. And it's just all these scenes of skeletons doing things like impaling someone on a lance or, you know, just all of these images, which would not be out of place in something like, you know, Army of Darkness or, you know, one of those sort of things. Um, but we're taking that historical art and saying this is not allegorical. This is something that maybe the people actually saw at the time, you know. That and, they had. and you know what? Maybe it did. And then <laughs> um, those people died. So <laughs> all they left behind was this art. And all of this is true. Yep. <laughs> and, and yep. We, Seems plausible. We didn't, we didn't know. It's yep. possible. Oh, yeah. And and you know, and the sweet side of all of this is, oh, you know, when you're doing this medieval horror, you can be wearing period costumes. <laughs> so yep. That's the sweet side um, of, of all of this. But um, um, Chimera, though, uh, Chris, Chimera is like set in modern day times. Um, yeah. So... I wish it would have gone first. It's a tough act to follow. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what's think... really scary? A bear mixed with a human. Like that's my. <laughs> why why do you not think that's scary i do i do think it's scary oh I take, my god i take bear humans very seriously bear you mix are the pig worst. in there too mix pig in there as well you want oh. man bear and pig. man bear pig man, man, bear, pig. Bear, pig. <laughs> see everything i do is basically a joke that's that's the problem like, everything a very dread like very slow burn do you remember this thing that happened in history that killed a lot of people that's also what's happening in mine mine's like yeah people are basically clay and you just squish them together and then you <laughs> throw them out there no but i mean if, why, if why would you think that's horrifying are you kidding me it is horrifying i can't it's remember horrifying. the name of this there's a I mean, lot of real it's some of the i think some of the ones in the 70s are some of the worst offenders of this like these really really messed up stuff that are like done with um gosh what is it it's, it's basically like they said um the more body horror kind of thing like just some really grotesque like twisting of things um and of course i subjected to myself more than i ought to have um but I do it for market all research. For you. I do yeah. it all for you guys. Okay, this is all for you. Um, so Thank you don't you, have to. I do. You're welcome. Um, so if you're looking to to do a scene, is like you are. Let's just say you have been. You've weathered the, the worst of it, you know. Because the thing is, with with I didn't really mention this, but the way that the virus spreads and the way that works is by 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 transduction, which really only works if um, and this is. Uh, it really works if, if uh, the flesh is uh, wet and pliable. So during dry climates or during times you're in, in dry climates, it, it's not really a thing. And so actually the, in, a lot of stress in, in this game is going to come from the mass migration of people away from wetter areas to drier ones because they have to, because the uh, the camera viruses to adapt so much to the dry climate, it becomes less of a, a grotesque monstrosity and become more like regular zombies. Um, so, but in the wetter climates, they can grow and change and become something completely different so if you're talking about worrying about the seasons as they change like you could also be worried about things crawling out from the sewers and or from the uh or from the subways of kind of just hibernating there until until the time was right so there are a few scenarios where it involves you going down and trying to find hibernating nests before they become active again and what happens is that you find that not only do you see people who are kind of just living down there because you know they can, they're affected, they don't have to worry about it quite as much, but they've been making things. They've been waiting for this. They've been trying to find out what they can unleash upon, what their creations they can unleash upon the, uh, the surface world, basically. 
um or You're going down to midian where the monsters live oh man <laughs> they're, they're um, thinking in their plan and then their flesh is wet and pliable no yep and some so, Herbert Westry animator twisted. stuff. <laughs> so there's that, and then having the the ghost ship as it was as a precursor to this. So that was like you know, the everyone. So everyone's kind of fine. It's not like every, it's society started to get it back on speed a little bit. You're being you're able to hire yourself out as a mercenary. You find out that a cruise ship that was used to kind of keep people as, as a at arm's length during the earlier that went that has since gone missing is now back, and this is three years later. You don't want to know what's on that ship, but it's yeah. coming for the shore and it's not responding. You know, so, what, you know what that it's reminds been out me there of, incubating. Chris, <laughs> that that reminds me of a uh, uh, U.S. military with like submarines, uh, submarines that go missing. Um, they they are not considered lost. They are still considered um, still on patrol. Really, which is horrifying in a sense because then flying it's like, Dutchman. <laughs> then then that means that they they we expect them back they're still mm. on patrol and you saying that with that cruise ship my dude no <laughs> sorry please done. continue the ghost ship, is, the ghost ship yeah. is an interesting one too because we've actually there's a couple people out there at this point that have gotten to sample that one um because as as we're prone to do here at hunters we like to play test things early and stuff like that and we'd like to do it with the community so uh chris has actually run that one a couple times at cons now at this point for some folks yeah the concept is always that this thing is coming to shore you don't want to make land because whatever's in there is going to get dislodged and disrupt whatever relative unity has been has been rebuilt uh with blood, sweat, and tears. Um, so boarding it, you have to go down to the decks and see what has not touched has been touched by light for years sometimes. And uh, it could be just people who have succumbed, or it could be something that has been made. And this the having found going deeper and deeper into into the uh, the cruise ship, you can see what was done is for the further away from light that they get. Um, so it was fun. I said I had uh, some family members who worked on cruise ships, so I asked them for some details about the nooks and crannies of things, and that was fun. Um, <laughs> oh, no. I'm thinking of like the Queen Mary and stuff too. Like it's when so, you, yeah. go and, you go on the Queen Mary, and it's so creepy to be in these sort of weird, cramped little hallways and stuff. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, I took some. Actually, that's that's where I took some photo references for it. Mm. And I had a crap camera at the time, so I, I couldn't use all of them. That's but just more authentic. You want them to be all grainy and <laughs> yeah. scary. Oh. Uh, there, there's there's a limit sir flip phones are not are not worthy <laughs> because I <didn't> have a, <laughs> that was how long ago that was i mean i've but no I, I have a better camera now but at the same time i having it look really grainy and having to work with that like that, that does give a certain style consistency with it but unfortunately it does diminish anthony jones's art who had to composite into it because this stuff's so good but i have to like well i have to make it really crummy looking because this picture i'm using as a frame of reference is really crummy too um, but yeah, so that's, I mean, it's I'm, yeah. I'm, that, so not that's, as, not as narrative as Alquins, I'm sorry to say, but that's, that's the kind of stuff you're dealing with is like what uh, comes during the seasons. Of what I'm there with you, man. I've, I've, I, I've grown up playing stuff like Resident Evil and I'm just imagining the parts where like Wesker has this eye erupting from his shoulder. Like I want to find some of these artists and scientists and stuff who are, who are, uh, the new, doing stuff with the new flesh, you know, <laughs> they're artists, oh. sir artists <laughs> yeah yeah uh we did get a question from chat um alquin uh this might be very difficult for you so it's a-okay if mm -hmm. it cannot be done but not always week was wondering if you would show us one of your cats so uh, <laughs> okay yeah all right let, let me find one like, i'll go if grab that's one, a cool. <laughs> <Let me find> one. <laughs> i know just find one of the wrangling cats i know what, what? how does she know she had a cat <laughs> <laughs> they, right. they I have they, I have I have three cats and they show up on my streams a lot. This oh. is my this is my youngest guy. This is Sigurd. He's about two years oh. old, and he's very fr he's very frisky, but he's also very cuddly. Little sweet guy. Say hi. People want to say hi. <laughs> oh, hello, it's me, Sigurd. Oh, you <laughs> Oh, hi, little prince. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. And now all I can think of is that sweet little cat might actually be a body horror uh, yeah. type of thing. I think he would look cute with bat wings. 
an <laughs> annihilation type of thing, like in Chris's world. Oh yeah, that's another reference I hadn't thought about. That's that's also very on the sort of doorstep of a lot of that chimera stuff is the the yeah, annihilation uh, I, creatures. I caught that movie at the wrong time. I ended up having to to leave during the scene with the whole intestines are are not intestines. There's something else. There's something else type of scene. I was like, you know what? Mm, I'm good and I will touch this another time. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there's, there's no shame in knowing your limits with stuff like yeah. that. You know, like there, there have been things where I've, you know, I, I love horror. I seek it out. But I, you know, I've been watching horror since I was eight years old. I, I, I literally have a horror podcast where I, yeah. I adjust this daily. But yeah, I was just like, you know what? No. Sometimes a specific thing can just hit you different, you know, yeah. for reasons you understand or don't. And it is, yeah. you know, it's totally no issue with just being like, you know what? I'm good. I'm good <laughs> <laughs> about this specifically. You know, I still like being scared. I still like all those other things, but just not this you know lines and veils yeah right <laughs> for that exactly <laughs> exactly that um alex could you give us a, a little scene uh from possible with like deep space is a-okay if not and also for our chat room if you have any we're going to be wrapping up our conversation soon so if you have any uh questions or like comments that you want to get in go ahead and uh let us know now and we'll actually end on those so uh, yeah. so one of the things that I know that they're doing with deep space, um, and I know it's not going to be throughout the entire cosmos uh, that this will be in effect, but there is a, a large subset of the cosmos where this ends up being a thing. Um, but they kind of take uh, capitalism to the sci-fi level, um, and you end up with entire like large regions and um in some cases even entire celestial bodies that are just entirely corporately owned uh locations um so you you essentially do have a system of megacorps that are kind of starting to slowly but surely take over the uh the galaxy there um which i think they were taking a little bit of inspiration from like uh, a few different sources in regards to that and all carbon wayland um, um, wayland yeah. yutani alter carbon <laughs> right. the uh the building the, better worlds <laughs> um uh for video game references for a recent one the the outer worlds i think did a fairly comedic uh, uh take on the idea of corporations kind of taking over a uh, planet it's a uh, wholesale. It's um, not the best choice. It's the spacer's choice. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's, uh, there's going to be a bit of that. Um, I don't want to spoil uh, on this, though, what exactly is going on with their outbreak, because I imagine we'll probably have some folks on from that supplement at some point to talk about it. So, We'll Definitely. save some of those. Yeah, we'll save some of those spoilers for when. Uh, I mean, when we I know that they're here. undead tribbles, but I'm not supposed to say that. <laughs> is, is this Mike hot? Oh, damn, sorry. <laughs> I forgot oh, come to on, mute man. again. Oh, wait, we can hear you. Mute his ass. God damn. Uh. <laughs> But yeah, there will there'll definitely be some interesting sci-fi fun. Um, and one of the things I think is going to be kind of interesting about Deep Space is that um, they're, they're placing it at a point, uh, at least storyline-wise, where the outbreak hasn't completely wrecked the entire cosmos yet. Um, but it's it's certainly on its way. So we're not looking at like necessarily like an outbreak level four type situation yet. Um, but I also wouldn't necessarily say we're looking at uh, all the way down at an outbreak level one in the setting either. So it, it's starting to kick off, but there is still, like I said, we, we're bringing in like the, uh, the wealth and uh, price level system from Altered Carbon. So there will still be potential chance for like actual still stabilized economies in certain areas and you can really start playing with the flavor of how the outbreak's going to work when you got this whole galactic global scale man um i i had like things that i was going to say and then um not always weak like did the best comment where uh they said uh capitalism is a horror game <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> It's like, yeah, with like a uh, deep space uh, in general. And it's just like, yeah, and, and also in life. Um, oh my gosh. 
Uh, yeah, uh, it, it's I, a I, it's a risky thing, if, especially if it goes unchecked. Mm. Um, like obviously, like capitalism can absolutely work perfectly fine as a, as a system when it's properly balanced, and you don't just let the corporations do literally anything that they want to maximize profits. Because <laughs> well, <laughs> that's, that's the great thing about it, though, because you've taken it to the ludicrous extreme where that exactly. isn't being done. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think, actually, not that we're talking about altered carbon, but I think they did a pretty good job of showing the kind of tension that goes, because they have the protectorate, which is just this like, colossal globe-spanning, you know, universe-spanning government and then you have mega corporations and then there's a people kind of crushed between these two these two things working against each other's interests and there's everyone else who's just kind of sandwiched between them and i think that that was actually one of the few things that i i thought was done with some finesse in the book i mean they didn't really get onto it into the, into the show as much but in the books for sure they're talking about how the corporate wars did worked and um i think broken angels did this quite a lot and did a really, mm. pretty good job of it too I'm just saying like these corporations sponsor these huge digs and then the protectorate comes in and just takes it. It's like, okay, well, that's like, these are two giant monsters fighting each other and we're like just sitting back with popcorn watching it. So yeah. I think that the, 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 the um, and having to be able to terraform whole planets and the expense that goes along with that, it's like, there's a lot of like perspective issues to go into that. But I think having it just, the fact that that's even possible just shows you how uh, bloated and how uh, exaggerated that is. And I think that's done. Uh, the, the Caribbean, did Dead Space do this too? I mean, it's been done a few times pretty well. But I, I can't so. remember. Yeah, yeah, Dead Space, like, they cracked planets in half for their minerals. Like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> like a big geode. <laughs> yeah. It's like, well, okay. how else are you going to get to the creamy center? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> get to that nougat. And you, right? if you, if you unlock some ancient horror, that's just the cost of doing business, right? Yeah. I mean, you gotta break a few eggs or planets. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, if we, <laughs> if we can't stop, you know, going into ancient tombs now. <laughs> ancient tombs yeah. that we have no business going into. Everybody on Twitter is like, "Do not open that." It is oh, right? not enough. Everyone's Don't like, open it. <laughs> right. <laughs> then of course we're not going to learn in the future. <laughs> I mean, if we survive, um, you know, uh, the great mortality, the uh, the Black Plague, then we'll survive this and keep on making these very human decisions. Yeah. Um, uh, or we don't, and whatever transhuman goo evolves that from the Chimera <laughs> world, that's what survives. Yeah, I, I'd like to think that it's one of the puppy bats uh, that also <laughs> is a body with it, horror with its friend Living Bucket. Yeah, yeah, right. Puppy bat and and the living bucket. I I'd watch that cartoon on like Cartoon Network. <laughs> you know I don't we'll know. I think that might be Adult Swim if we're making it. That's adult. You know? Yeah, you're right. That's <laughs> that's Adult Swim. Yeah, sure. Puppy bat and the living bucket. <laughs> okay, y'all. Yeah. This has been such <laughs> such a hardcore spoopy conversation, and I very much enjoy this. Um, uh, all of you, uh, thank you so much for joining us with this, and also with our chat room, y'all are a freaking blast uh some of these comments that y'all have done like scabby rooster was like let them eat brains <laughs> <laughs> for instance y'all are a trip um and uh very much enjoy uh just want to reiterate that we are doing giveaways on our tuesday night um continuing on ongoing campaign of uh, Outbreak Undead Zombie series. Uh, that campaign happens uh, Tuesday, 6 p.m. PT. And to just say once again, Josh from Wolverhampton, England, congratulations for winning the first, I have to change my screens, uh, the first uh, giveaway, which was Outbreak Undead Survivor's Guide, Game Master's Guide, and Strain Series Zombie PDF Bundle. Congrats. And then also- I do got to correct you on one thing real quick, Marquia. Just oh, please. Because I, I want to make sure that uh, the other players in the game don't think that they can try to get sneaky with it. But oh. you're not actually playing in Zombie on Tuesday. Tuesday. Um, you are playing in Knox's own horrible twisted creation of that that he's cooked up that I, I have knew it. Yeah, I, I knew it. You you're gonna have to just you're gonna have to see what kind of surprises come. You can't even try to sneak into the supplement books mm -hmm. and get an idea there. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't do that anyway, but I I I knew that there was something going on with that world. I was like, this is really messed up. Like this is messed up on so many levels. I was like yeah, this has got some Knoxweiler birth all over it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Excellent. Um, but yeah, for for um, gatherings giveaways, which we will be starting tonight, so you can enter between now and then we will be announcing our winner um, this upcoming Friday, where our plan is to do a movie watch along and we will advertise this um, on our social media. Um, there is a kids on bikes, kids on bikes esque uh, movie. Uh, called Vampires versus the Bronx. And Doug Levinowski and some other Kids on Bikes members will be joining us for, literally, we're going to hang out. We're going to watch this movie. Obviously, we can't show it on Twitch. <laughs> um, but, and you can join us in the chat. We will time code it together. And we will Kids on Bikes, a horror movie together for the day before um, actual Halloween. So this is our plan. Go ahead and join us on uh, social media, our Discord. I'm also on Twitter um, at Hunters uh, underscore ENT, uh, obviously here on Twitch with Hunters Entertainment. Go ahead and follow. Um, go ahead and subscribe. We've got some really great emotes and then some really awesome emotes coming in the future with like different tiers that we're planning on doing. I want to do a real awesome shout out to our moderators. Thank you so much for everything that you do. And then also our tech wizard, JB Jara, that's helping run the show and uh, keep it looking and, and keeping us looking really good <laughs> while we're doing it. Our chat room, you are just so amazing. Um, we hope that you join us for the rest of Roll20 Con. Um, remember Saturday, October 24th, we will be doing Outbreak Undead, The Fog. Our GM will be Ivan Van Norman. That will start at 6 p.m. PT. You know, come check in and watch him kill some of the people that you really enjoy on the internet. And then also we'll be doing uh, on Sunday, October 25th, we'll have Alice is Missing, facilitated by the creator, uh, Spencer Stark. And yeah, maybe everybody would make it out of there. Maybe not, but also 6 p.m. PT. And thank you so much for um, the three of you for having this really <laughs> disturbing conversation about the future of the Strain series <laughs> that we can expect here at Hunter's Entertainment. Keeping in mind that Chimera that we were discussing um, we is scheduled to be released in 2020 and Dance Macabre is scheduled to be released in 2021. So thank you so much, um, Alex Hillman, our project manager. Thank you so much, uh, creator of Dance Macabre, uh, Alquin Gersh. And uh, thank you so much, uh, creator of uh, Chimera, and then also co-founder of Hunters Entertainment, uh, Christopher J. De La Rosa, for joining us. And thank you, you, for, you know, being here every week. And uh, keep in mind that if you aren't able to watch all of this, or you're like, oh, I don't want to miss anything, or I want to rewatch things, and I'm not a subscriber, we do release this on YouTube about a week after it airs. So about um, each Thursday, you can do a catch up, and then Friday uh, is the show. So yeah, I have been uh, your producer and host, Marquia McCarty. Thanks so much for joining us here on Hunter's uh, Gathering. And we will see you next Friday, uh, 6 p.m. PT. Let's watch a movie together. <laughs> That's going to be fun. It's going to be right, awesome. Enjoy, yeah. enjoy the rest of your Roll20 Con. We'll see you tomorrow. All right.